Hello everyone, this is Sushita Gupta, ACC affiliate, and we are resuming with our PM syllabus revision. This is chapter 5, and this chapter pertains to your CVP analysis, which is also your cost, volume, profit analysis. So over here, we are primarily going to, first of all, learn about what this analysis is all about, then what are the assumptions, then what are the various formulas that, you know, we have to use to work out the calculations. So let's get started started so first of all it is very important to know what we are studying is called the cost volume profit analysis and it is also called the break even analysis right so break even uh, basically is nothing if i have to just define it in a very uh, layman language it is that point of a revenue where you are not making any profits or any losses so basically you are at a no profit no loss situation that means whatever money that you are getting from the business is something which is your cost and you are not making any profits and at the same time there are no losses also so basically this situation is your break even point so uh, like i've already told you cvp analysis is also called the break even analysis and if we uh, so basically this point is also solved uh, you, you know the way we reach at this point is basically using a graph so using this graph uh, you are plotting this is your x axis this is your y axis so on your x axis which is the horizontal axis you are plotting your level of activity so the number of units that you are producing and selling is something which is plotted on your horizontal axis and on your y axis which is the vertical axis you will be plotting your costs and revenues so basically, this will be the dollar line and this will be the units line. Now, uh, level of activity means how many units you are producing and selling. So basically, this is how you will be plotting the graph. And again, repeating that break-even point will be the point where you are not incurring any losses and at the same time not making any profits also. So uh, let's first see what the assumptions of the analysis are so any model that you study whichever model which you will study will have certain assumptions it might be taking some things to be constant and again whenever there are assumptions to that model those assumptions become its limitations because it is something which they are taking for granted and that may not be case may not be the case in real life scenarios so that is why these assumptions also become the limitations of the model so uh, there are quite a few assumptions in cvp analysis let's go through them one by one so the first assumption that we have in cvp analysis is that your behavior of total cost and your total revenue will uh, is you know de uh, determined reliably and will remain uh, linear in the range so basically this means that as my total revenue will go up so will my total cost in a linear manner so this is one of the assumptions that cvp has another assumption that cvp has is that all costs can be divided into fixed and variable elements so basically if there is any cost that the business has so it will either be fixed or it will be variable there is no in between so it's either fixed or variable it can also be divided into the two elements then the third assumption that we have is total fixed costs will remain constant over the relevant volume range in the cvp analysis so perhaps if we are doing an analysis up till let's suppose a hundred thousand units so till all the activity levels till the 100,000 units are fixed cost. The total fixed cost is going to remain the same constant, right? Over that specific range over which we are doing our analysis. Then the fourth assumption that CVP analysis has is that your total variable costs are directly proportioned to the volume. So basically what it in a nutshell or in a simpler language means is that if my variable cost per unit is $6 and this is at an activity level of 
10,000 units. So perhaps if I'm producing 100,000 units, even then my variable cost per unit will remain $6. So this is what the assumption is that no matter how much number of units we are producing in the range in which we are doing the CVP analysis, the total variable costs are directly proportional to the volume. Then fifth point, fifth assumption is that there are no changes to the selling price. The selling prices are going to be constant. A lot of things are, uh, you know, assumed to be constant under the CVP analysis. So another assumption is that your prices of the factors of production will be remaining unchanged. Factors of production are nothing but your labor, your raw material. So all of these things are going to remain, the prices of these things are going to remain constant or you can say unchanged. Then another assumption that we have is that your efficiency and pro productivity will also be the same. So basically, if uh, my labor is producing, let's suppose 10 units in one hour, so even if uh, they are required to produce, uh, let's suppose 20,000 units, they're going to take the same amount of time that they are taking. So my efficiency and my productivity are also unchanged. This is another assumption of the CVP analysis. Now, another assumption, uh, so like I told you in the beginning itself, there are a lot of assumptions. So eighth assumption that we have is that the analysis either covers a single product or assumes that a sales mix will be maintained. So basically, Either, you know, you there are two scenarios. In scenario one, you are only selling, let's suppose, uh, shoes. So you are only selling one type of shoes. And uh, this is the first uh, scenario that only shoes will be sold and produced and sold by you. And another thing, if probably you are selling three types of shoes, let's suppose A shoes, B shoes, C shoes. <clears throat> My apologies. So if there are three types of shoes, then you already know in how much proportion are you going to sell these shoes. So maybe uh, my proportion is going to be two is to two is to one. So this proportion is going to remain constant over the number of units that I'm going to produce and sell. So this is another assumption under CVP analysis, which may or may not hold true in real life scenarios. Then another assumption under this is that your revenue and cost are being compared on a single activity basis. So basically this means that you will be, uh, so for example, your units produced and sold or the sales value of your production. So basically this means that the revenue and your costs are going to be taken at one single activity level basis. Single activity level basis. Now another assumption which this model has is that uh, you know, all the uh, the volume is only the relevant factor which is affecting the cost. Of course, other factors also affect the cost uh, and sales. However, the, you know, uh, the main, the most basic assumption that it takes is that volume is the thing which is driving all the changes in the costs. So this is one of the most basic assumptions of CVP analysis. And then Another, the last assumption perhaps that we are discussing about this analysis is that the volume of production is equal to the volume of sales. <clears throat> so this means how much ever I'm going to manufacture, how much ever I'm going to produce is going to be the same as what I'm going to be selling. So I'm, uh, you know, basically assuming that there's going to be no opening inventory and there's going to be no closing inventory, no or negligible, uh, considering that my, uh, as much as I'm producing, I'm selling it off at the same time. So this, these are the few basic assumptions of CVP analysis. Now uh, let's look at the various formulas which are involved in this chapter. So first of all, we have the formula of break-even. So break even will be at the point in uh, when you're calculating in terms of units. So in terms of units, you will arrive at your answer by 
dividing the contribution by the fixed cost. So fixed cost divided by contribution per unit. This will give you your break even in terms of the number of units that you're supposed to sell in order to be able to uh, be in a position where you're at a no profit or a no loss situation. Then there's another concept which is about margin of safety. So margin of safety basically talks about <clears throat> just to be safer or to be on a safer side that you're not incurring any losses. How much should be the number of units that you're going to sell? So basically, uh, and also uh, when you are comparing that, you know, uh, probably now my sales is $10,000 and now I am, uh, you know, covering all of my costs. I'm at a no profit, no loss situation. Perhaps in the next year, uh, my revenue uh, is, let's suppose, $20,000 and now I am at a more safer level because I am more than meeting my costs. So margin of safety basically tells you how much above, how much margin do you have above the safety. Safety is where you are at a no loss, no profit situation. But margin of safety will tell you how much above are you in that margin. So basically margin of safety will be calculated using your budgeted sales, how much you are thinking to sell minus your break even sales. So budgeted sales is basically something which you're thinking that you're going to be making and break even sales is the sales wherein you will have a no profit or no loss. So basically margin of safety will tell you how much margin do you have with you that you know if your sales probably go down how safe or unsafe are you to be uh, incurring losses. Then if I have to work it out as a percentage so MOS if I want a percentage this will be equal to margin of safety margin of safety in terms of units divided by budgeted sales multiplied by 100. So this will give you a margin of safety percentage that how much margin do you have before you start incurring losses. Then uh, another thing which we can calculate over here is our weighted average CS ratio. So CS ratio, as the name suggests, is nothing but contribution divided by sales. So weighted average will be when we multiply this according to the number of units that we are selling. So let's suppose there are two products that I sell, A and B. Contribution is 10 and 5 for this. And the number of units uh, maybe are 20 and 10. So basically, so this is units and this is contribution. So my weighted average uh, contribution to sales ratio is going to uh, take into account the fact that, you know, these are two, uh, two uh, products that I'm selling in different quantities and different ratios. And it's going to take into account that uh, it'll give me how much on an average sale uh, am I earning a contribution. So uh, this is what the weighted average contribution will tell you. So uh, over here, you're just supposed to take the total contribution and divide that by the total revenue or sales. So if I find out how much the total contribution would be, <clears throat> total contribution over here, if I find out will be 220 into 10 plus 5 into 10, 50. And if I work out at the sales, so the sales uh, revenue basically, so I, I would need my selling price. So let's suppose the selling price is two and no, uh, let's suppose the selling price is 20 and let's suppose the selling price for this is 30. So uh, my total revenue is going to be 20 multiplied by 20, which is the number of units plus 30 multiplied by number of units, which is 10. So if I work this, uh, thing out, then I will get my weighted average CS ratio. Uh, then another thing which we can work out is the break even revenue. Break even revenue. So break even revenue will be nothing but taking your fixed cost and dividing that by your weighted average CS ratio. So this is how you can arrive at your break-even revenue. You're doing nothing but just taking the fixed cost, dividing that by the weighted average CS ratio because uh, this will give you the revenue at which you will have no profits and no losses. 
then uh, there are questions that will require you to calculate units required to be sold to earn a target profit. So basically the question will tell you that uh, these are the costs, uh, these are the fixed costs, this is the contribution, this is the sales and everything. So we as a firm want to have, let's suppose, a profit of $30,000. So what is the number of units that we should sell so that we are uh, able to meet all of our costs and then earn a profit of $30,000. So the formula that you can use to work this out is fixed costs. So basically the formula is going to remain the same, the break-even uh, units which we had over here, fixed costs divided by contribution per unit. So basically over here, because now we want a target profit also, we're just going to add the target profit over here. So if we have to work this out, so this will be fixed costs plus my target profit and dividing that by my, again, weighted average CS ratio. So basically, <clears throat> why we are adding the target profit is that now, instead of just meeting these fixed costs, we are also aiming at a target profit. In this case, in the example which I gave you is 30,000. So I will add 30,000 in the numerator and then divide that by the weighted average CS ratio. This will give me the units which are required to be sold in order to earn my target profit of $30,000. So this is the formula that you guys can use in such a scenario. Then it can also ask you the uh, sales revenue to earn a target profit. So in such a scenario, again, we are just going to take the fixed costs, add the target profit to that and then divide it by the weighted average CS ratio. So this will also give you your uh, the uh, the sales revenue which is required you can also uh, if you know the units which are there you can simply multiply that by the selling prices and then you will be uh, able to uh, arrive at the sales revenue that you are supposed to earn to have a target profit with you so these are all about the formulas that we have and then uh, another thing which can possibly be asked uh, pertaining to like it, it pertains to this chapter, but not necessarily related to this. So perhaps if you're asked to carry out a sensitivity analysis, sensitivity analysis, always and always remember whenever you are asked about the sales price sensitivity. Let me write this clearly. Sales price sensitivity then you will find that out using the profit divided by the total sales and multiply that by 100 but but if you are asked about the sales volume sensitivity so as soon as the volume comes into the picture it's going to be profit divided by the contribution multiplied by 100. Why is that so? Because, you know, uh, if we are making the sales, if we are, you know, making the sales, we are getting the sales price. So if I am selling you something for, let's suppose, $100, $100 is what I'm getting. But when we talk about volume, so basically volume is something which, uh, you know, contribution will be something which will be affected if I have a lesser volume. My fixed costs are going to remain the same. Like we read in the assumptions above that the fixed costs up to the certain level of activity at which we are estimating the things in this analysis, the fixed costs are going to be same. So the only thing that my volume is going to affect is my contribution. That is why whenever we are arriving at the sensitivity when it comes to the sales volume, we will always use contribution in the denominator instead of the the total sales so please do remember this thing even if you're you know 
try do try to get the concept behind this i have tried to explain that but even if you're not able to understand why, what the concept is why we are doing that always and always just feed this into your mind that whenever you are required to find out the sales price sensitivity then you will use the sales and when it is sales volume sensitivity you will use the contribution so uh, this is it about chapter number 5 we will catch you for chapter number 6 in the next video i hope that these videos are being useful in your preparation should you have any more queries please feel free to drop them in the comments below you can also dm us on being acc on instagram uh all right then bye bye